I think we're about ready to begin, so I'm going to ask Sarah Drummond if she would start our session. Thank you, Tom, and welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Birmingham Drummond, and in a moment I'll introduce myself and say a little bit more about where I'm coming from, both literally and figuratively. Tom Tanner is running our slide presentation, and I would ask if you could advance our slides. I can do that right now, Sarah. Just give me one okay. second. You got it. Okay. So what you'll see ahead of you, if you're looking at your screen, is the agenda for our session this morning, and it includes the following. We're going to take some time for some welcome and some prayer. Then we'll learn some about where we are in the standards redevelopment process and how we got here. And then my, my uh, vice chair, Oliver McMahon, is going to lead us in some discussion where we'll have an opportunity to receive your questions as well as your suggestions and input. So if we could advance again, Tom. The prayer that I've selected for this morning comes from a book called Simple Prayers for Complicated Lives. It's by Jennifer Phillips. And I found this prayer entitled, At the Computer. I don't know about you, but I am still just amazed that we're able to even have webinars. There are right now 93 people on the phone and five people on the panel, and we're all sitting at home. This is just a miracle as far as I'm concerned. I'll never get over it. And I'd like to pray this prayer to bring us together so that we might be mindful of the context where we're working and remember that even though we're connected over computers, we still can sense each other's presence and sense the presence of God among us. Let us pray. God, my wisdom and discernment, be with me as I sit down to work. I thank you for this computer for its ingenuity, for the connections it brings me, for the knowledge it makes available. May I always use it well and to your honor, keeping from too much use, choosing the good in what I do and avoiding the evil, guarding my words to others that they may be apt and kind. May I remember that it is the servant and you are the master, and so use it always as you would desire. God, we ask for your blessing on this meeting, and we pray that we might be able to hear each other as well as your words spoken through one another. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, hi, my name is Sarah, and I am the Dean of Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School. I welcome you to this meeting with what you'll see on your screen is a big red welcome. Those who were at the last biennial when we were as an ATS membership body talking about authorizing the redevelopment of standards, you might have seen those who were becoming part of the task force on standards redevelopment wearing buttons with the letters R-E-D in the color red emblazoned on their name tags. Red has been our signature color over these years of standards redevelopment task force work. R stands for residency, E stands for eligibility, and D stands for duration. And the reason we chose red and that acronym was we knew that heading into our work together as a task force, redeveloping the standards, residency, eligibility, and duration would be three key areas that we were going to be called upon to reconsider in a new time, in a new context for theological education, and also a newly diverse and therefore newly complex uh, body of schools and membership. Could you advance the slide, please? So you've had an opportunity to register for this webinar, and you might be wondering what's the purpose of, um, of coming, am I just here to listen to people talk about why it is that the changes that are being proposed are being proposed or how they got there? Well, certainly that will be part of it. But the main purpose for having an interactive format for this conversation 
namely the reason why we are making an interactive real-time webinar as opposed to an information uh, 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 information film, like an infomercial for the newly redeveloped standards draft, is that we're really at a moment in the process where your input and your suggestions are particularly crucial. So I shared with my colleagues on the task force just the other day that so I'm the Dean of Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School, as I already said. And our school in the past, over the past five years, has moved from being the oldest freestanding graduate school of any kind in the United States to becoming embedded at Yale Divinity School, which was formed in the same theological movement by the same theological thinkers, but has operated separately from Andover Newton. Over these years, I can't tell you how many times I've relied on colleagues in the ATS to help me to remain sane and sometimes even courageous in this changing theological education landscape. And it just so happens that this week marks the halfway point in a five-year embeddedness um, process, a five-year process of becoming part of of um, Yale Divinity School as Andover Newton at Yale. And at this midpoint, we're having a lot of conversations here in New Haven about what about our work together needs to change before we can move into final affiliation. In a similar way, this webinar is taking place at the moment between the second draft of the redeveloped standards and what will be the draft that's presented in Vancouver in June. What that means is that the cement is still soft and there's still time to make meaningful changes based on your suggestions, input, and questions. So there's a reason why we have an interactive format. It's because we really need you. These standards belong to the membership. I'm not part of the ATS staff, although I can't tell you how much I appreciate and enjoy working with the ATS staff. I'm a member who is um, has a, a full-time day job at one of the member schools. And I really believe that the more we as members name that these are our standards that we're holding ourselves and our colleagues to make them our own, the better job we'll do redeveloping them in a way that is really helpful to our schools, clarifying to our schools, but also holding ourselves and each other to the highest possible standards because our schools and our churches and our students really deserve that. So that's why we're here. And now we'll move into a time where Tom Tanner will help us to understand where, um, where we are in the process. Again, these are your standards. We're listening and we still can because we're still working on this redevelopment process. And bear in mind that we only redevelop the standards once in a generation. It's been 25 years since the last time the standards were redeveloped. That doesn't mean that we won't have revisions in between redevelopments. We have and we will. So we're, we're preparing ourselves, poising ourselves for the not likelihood, not possibility, but the absolute certainty that theological education will continue to change in the future at what sometimes feels like a breakneck pace. So we're trying to build redeveloped standards in such a way that we only have to redevelop them once in a generation, but that we can re remain nimble and flexible in between time so our standards can be responsive to the realities in which our schools are, are leading themselves. So again, I turn the, the, turn the floor over to my colleague, Tom Tanner. Thank you, Sarah, very much. This is Tom Tanner, the ATS staff, one of the directors of accreditation. I also have the privilege of serving as the commission staff liaison to the redevelopment task force and it's been a pure privilege of my professional life to be part of this process. I want to just say right up front before Oliver joins us uh, in about 15 or 20 minutes to entertain your questions that while we welcome your questions, comments, and suggestions, uh, there are over 100 people registered for this webinar. And there's just too many to do that orally live. So you really have two, at least two options. One, you can email webinar at ats.edu. Uh, either before this meeting you could have done that or you can do it during the meeting. Or there's a Q&A pod in the upper middle section of your Zoom screen that you can always use that, click on that, and type in your question. And we have people monitoring those. So when we get to that part of this webinar, uh, we'll be able to read some of those back and get some different people responding to those. 
So I just wanted to give you that as a heads up before we launch into the process. So where are we in this process? It is, as Sarah said, a comprehensive redevelopment. And what does that mean? Well, since the first standards of IATS were adopted in 1936, we've had a, a modest revision of the standards on average about every four years. But only once every 24 years, as it happens, have we had a major comprehensive redevelopment. And this is one of those once in a generation opportunities. The original standards, as I said, in 1936 were only one page long, nine paragraphs. The first major revision didn't happen until 1972. By then, they had grown to 30 pages. That was the first time that the Master of Divinity was mentioned. Before that, it had been the Bastard Divinity. The first time the Doctor of Ministry was mentioned in the standards. First time women were mentioned and issues of race and ethnicity. The first time evaluation came up in a serious way in the standards. The second major revision, the last major revision, was in 1996. By then, the standards had grown to 85 pages. And now we're in the middle. It was a modest revision back in 2010-12 that many of you may remember, which had grown the standards to 98 pages. We're now in the third major revision, the year 2020. The second draft that was published a week ago Monday is down to 19 pages. So we're trying to listen carefully and seriously to the membership who are seeking a simpler set of standards. If you want to learn more about where we are in this process and get some background information, you can go to the ATS website and click under the accrediting menu and, and then look at for the redevelopment of the ATS standards and policies and procedures. The second public draft I mentioned a moment ago was just released a week ago Monday, and those are available on our website. One other thing that the Board of Commissioners did this last uh, late last month, and it's now up on the website, is they adopted a grandfathering set of grandfathering procedures. If the membership approves these new standards in June of 2020 at the Vancouver Biennial Meeting, then uh, if that happens, then the board has anticipated that and said, here's what will happen as of July 1 in terms of any petitions, in terms of any reports, in terms of any self-study uh, processes and conference of visits that schools may have. Basically, it's a two-year implementation process, but I would encourage you to take a look at that on the redevelopment webpage. There has been a two-year timeline that the Redevelopment Task Force has worked with, beginning in June of 2018, when the membership authorized the Board of Commissioners to redevelop the standards. The first year, the past year, was a year of listening, researching, and reflecting. It builds upon the four-year, $7 million educational models project, <clears throat> that was a project that engaged more than 95% of the ATS membership over a four-year period. There were a number of peer groups that met together on everything from uh, global engagement to doctor of ministry to accelerated MDiv programs to uh, formation. And those peer groups generated hundreds of pages of reports that informed the redevelopment task force when it began its work a year and a half ago. During this year of listening, the task force has met with 50 different focus groups and assigned 12 different working groups to address issues that may not have been covered through the Educational Models Project. Those 50 focus groups involved more than 700 ATS participants this past year from 200 different ATS schools. And we've had working groups looking at issues like diversity and governance and formation and degrees. Uh, so it's been a lot of membership input during this year of listening. In fact, the task force collected more than 1,100 membership comments. They were coded by professional coders into 50 different categories. The top seven themes that seemed to emerge during this year of listening before the task force ever began writing a single word of the new standards were these. Quality, above all else, the membership said we want standards that emphasize educational quality. Secondly, and almost as importantly, almost tied with it, was we want standards that are simpler and clearer. A third key theme that emerged was the issue of modality, not the issue of modality neutrality, but the issue of modality accountability. Whatever modality a school chooses, we need to make sure the standards hold them accountable for markers of quality. The fourth theme was the issue of degrees. Primarily, the membership was saying the current 10 categories of degrees seem overly complicated, and would there be a way that the standards can simplify that? The fifth theme dealt with diversity. And again, our membership is so diverse that there was no single definition that emerged, but there was a high value placed on the, on the core value that ATS membership schools have in diversity. 
and that's reflected in these proposed standards. The sixth theme that emerged was, could we please streamline the self-studies and the petition process? And the policies and procedures, the other documents that the membership will approve in June, have gone a long way toward accomplishing that goal of the membership. And finally, number seven of the top themes was the issue of flexibility. Can we adopt a set of standards that gives schools some flexibility within their own mission, within their own constituency, to implement in ways that make sense for that school and not a one-size-fits-all. You can kind of summarize those seven themes into three basic themes. The membership was saying we want standards that emphasize contextualized definitions of quality. We want standards that focus on elegant simplicity, and elegant is a good Latin word that means carefully chosen simplicity. And we want standards that focus on principles more than practices. The task force realized really early on that with all the diversity of our membership, if we proposed a set of standards that were based on all the best practices, we would probably end up with a 300 page set of standards. So the task force chose to focus on key educational principles and allow schools to implement a variety of practices as long as they meet those principles. One of the issues that the task force wrestled with early on was how do we wrestle with all the different membership comments and so many varying opinions. And this quotation from a former CEO of Netscape, now Firefox, uh, kind of encapsulated that issue for us as a task force. If we have data, let's look at data. If all we have are opinions, well, let's go with mine. So with 19 members of the task force representing uh, US and can Canada and representing all three ecclesial families and representing small schools and big schools and and such a diversity of the membership, there are lots of good opinions, and all those opinions matter. But when there are significant differences of opinion, we've tried very hard to look at the data, what the member schools have been telling us through that information, and tried to rely on that as a kind of arbiter in, this, um, in any kind of controversy along those lines. The second year in this process has been what we call the year of writing, revising, and recommending. And we didn't actually have the very first draft or the very first standard until after the first year was over. And then we, the task force was very serious and spent much of the summer and early fall in putting together a set of standards. The first public draft was released on December the 2nd. We received actually 120 comments on that. And those comments were all read by the task force and by the Board of Commissioners and informed changes in the second public draft. That second public draft was released on uh, this past a week ago, Monday, and we're asking for comments by March 5th uh, on the second public draft. We're doing that through a variety of means, all spelled out on the redevelopment webpage, but two of those key means are these, what we're calling six regional meetings. We've had two already this week. The first one was in Philadelphia at St. Charles Borromeo Seminary, and the second one was yesterday in Toronto at, the, at uh, Knox College. We've had 150 people register for those webinars. We have four more coming up. Next week, we'll be in Chicago and in Dallas. And the following week, we'll be in Los Angeles and in Seattle. So we've tried to look at the continent, North America, on the East Coast, of the center, and on the West. Then we're having these two webinars. So far, over 200 people have registered for these two webinars. The first one is today, and the last one will be on March 4th. That will all lead us to, based on all those membership comments between the second and third draft, the third public draft will go out on no later than 8th of May, 2020, and that will become the public draft that is sent out to the member schools for a discussion and vote at the June 24th and 25th biennial meeting in Vancouver. If you've seen, and hopefully you have, the proposed draft of standards, the first draft and the second draft, we're proposing going from 19 standards to 10, from 30,000 words to 8,000 words, from 572 numbered sections to 115. The preamble is an important piece that I would encourage everyone to read because it sets the stage for the standards and talks about some important principles of interpretation. And I'll unpack one or two of those in a few moments. Student learning and formation form in many ways the heart of these standards. That's been the focus of the task force. And there's also been some discussion about the master's degrees and the doctoral degree programs. And so let me unpack those, standard four and five, for just a moment. Standard four deals with master's degrees, standard five with doctoral. 
the membership was saying, could we collapse the 10 degree categories into six? So we've done that with three master's degree categories and three doctoral degree categories. You'll notice under four, seven through 11, the master of arts, that there's no longer a distinction between academic and professional. There's not a separate category just for um, uh, music degrees. So we've said a master of arts can be all of those or either of those. It's up to each school to decide. No school has to change any of its current programs or any of its current names uh, to meet the new standards, but it gives schools a lot more flexibility in meeting the new standards. If you look at the structure of the standard, there's some intentionality behind that. It's like bookends with the central core. The central core is on students, standard three through eight. Student learning and formation, including the degree programs, are on three, four, and five. And those programs and personnel that most directly serve students, student services, library services, and faculty are in six, seven, and eight. The first bookend deals with mission and integrity and planning and evaluation on an institutional level. And the second bookend deals with governance and administration and institutional resources, again, more on an institutional level, with student focus being the center of all those standards. We're also, the membership we approving in June of 2020 at the biennial meeting, uh, a set of new set of policies and procedures. Those are currently encapsulated in two documents, a 30-page set of commission procedures and a 45-page set of board policy manuals. That's now collapsed into one 35-page document, Commission Policies and Board Procedures. And briefly, we've uh, reduced the number of changes that are requiring petitions in these new procedures and policies. We've simplified the self-study process by what these gray boxes, annotated things called self-study ideas. And we've tried to abbreviate the self-study reports going from only addressing 10 standards where we currently address 19 standards. Some of the feedback, uh, before we get to the specific feedback on the first draft, I might mention the preamble again. It's the beginning of the standards. If you look at the standards and the interpretation section on page four of that in the annotated version, you'll notice that these standards articulate principles of quality, not necessarily all the best practices, but key principles of quality for graduate theological education because we realize theological education is a much broader enterprise, but this is the piece of it that ATS schools have, that all schools meet. These are standards, not suggestions, in various ways, meaning there could be a variety of ways that schools demonstrate that they're meeting the standards. There's not one particular way. These standards are written in a way that does not assume a particular norm, either an organizational model or a particular norm in education delivery. Rather, each school has the freedom and flexibility to decide what, what, what organizational models and what delivery methods would best suit its mission and its constituency. The importance of interpretation of these standards does not mean that they can mean whatever a school or an evaluation committee or the Board of Commissioners wants them to mean, and we try to address that three ways. One, the opening paragraphs for every standard begins with Theological schools are communities of faith and learning that, and then it unpacks whatever that standard has with its essential elements. There are a series of numbered statements after each of those essential elements that amplify those elements. And then in the annotated version, there are self-study ideas, what we call self-study prompts in the first draft, self-study ideas in the second draft, with some helpful tips about how a school might go about addressing that standard. The key here is to make sure that we don't introduce these gray boxes, these self-study ideas as a subsidiary, a secondary set of standards. Schools are held accountable to the standards, not to the ideas. We received mostly positive feedback on the first public draft, over 120 comments so far. They affirm strongly the overall direction of the standards, their quality, their clarity, appreciate the focus on principles that allow schools to implement them more contextually based. And they also like very much the brevity and the fact that they're less burdensome, especially in the policies and procedures. For example, the number of petitions could be reduced by as much as half. Uh, not every new degree program needs a petition now. Many of them can simply be done by way of notification. And secondly, in the self-study reports themselves, those could be as much as half as long as the current self-study reports, mainly because there are just fewer standards that schools will need to address. 
There have been some questions and concerns that have been raised in the first public draft and we're in the process of trying to address those. Some of those we've addressed in the second public draft. Some of those we're still wrestling with as a task force. Uh, one of the big issues has been, will these new standards that are principle-based uh, be able to hold schools sufficiently accountable because there are fewer what we're calling bright lines, that is to say, there's not as much math, there are not clear numbers as many in this, for example. There's no longer a 15% limit for admitting students to a master's degree who don't have a baccalaureate degree. Instead, the new standard 7.4 says, if you do admit any students without a baccalaureate degree, you have to document through rigorous means how they're able to do graduate level work. So it takes the math out of it, but it puts the emphasis on schools and documenting that they can actually say these schools, these students are ready for graduate level work. There's been some question of the role of self-study helps, what we call prompts in the first draft, calling ideas in the second draft, replaced many of the should words in those prompts with might words in the second draft, to again, to emphasize these are meant as helpful tips, not as a second set of standards. And then we've gotten some comments about the DMN in terms of its rigor, both in terms of its length or duration and in terms of admissions to that. And there may be questions from you that come up later in the session about that. The DMIN standard as is proposed is primarily a product from the Educational Models and Practices Project, the EMP. So we've taken what they've come up with based on their deliberations and tried to incorporate that into the new standards. There's also a question about global engagement. Currently it's pronounced very strongly in standard 3-4 on student learning and formation, but some have raised whether or not it should also be added to standard 1-4 on institutional integrity that global engagement is not just a student formation issue, but an institutional integrity issue. So the task force is continuing to process comments on that. The changes made so far between the first and second drafts, about 30 of those in the standards, nothing that the task force views as major. We have not heard any comments saying start over, throw this out, begin all over again but rather a question about this or that or some word or some phrase or some particular standard. There are more than 15 uh, revisions in the policies and procedures, uh, again, mostly minor in nature, and also would add that we're in the process, the Board of Commissioners is developing a new self-study handbook. We'll go from seven chapters of 170 pages down to one chapter of 35 or so pages. We're also implementing new training uh, procedures for evaluators so that they're up to speed on the new standards and we'll uh, implement those, interpret those standards in a consistent way uh, 